And the last, the last teaching I leave you with is one of the most sublime, I think, um, and, and very subtle one. It, it's called the uncarved block, okay? The uncarved block. What is the uncarved block? L Lao Tzu says, and it's translated many ways uh, in English. And I don't know what the original Chinese says, and that's probably translated many ways too, uh, from the ancient to the you know, contemporary Chinese. But uh, he says, Lao Tzu says, when the Tao is luminous inside you, you will revert to the uncarved block, the primal state. And they talk about children being so happy with this natural joyfulness that children have for a while. And then what happens is that life carves them into some strange shape. And they lose that joyfulness by being carved by life. You know, a carved block is a problem. The uncarved block is beautiful because it contains all possible carvings, all possibilities. In the, uh, if you wake up in the morning and you look and see a world full of possibility, it's a joyful world. If you wake up in the morning and you see the world carved into a strange shape because you've been carved into a strange shape, this is not joyful always. So the uncarved block is a very, they call it primal. In Western psychology, we have the primal screen. You know, no, 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 no. They mean the primal state of joyfulness, uh, which I think has parallels perhaps in, in, in Buddhist teaching also. So this uncarved block is, uh, is an interesting teaching. And I'll give you two practical illustrations of it in Western terms, okay, to finish with. But think about China. China's a very traditional culture, beautiful, elegant traditions, deep. Uh, and long-standing cultural traditions that endure to this day. But China's also, you know, transforming out of mind. So the boats that go down the Li River past these amazing uncarved blocks of nature's work are motorized boats, you know, um, but they used to be paddle boats, or boats. But still, the beautiful scenery is the same and the appreciation of beauty is the same. And the carvings of nature are deemed to be superior to the carvings of humans. So this is a different kind of perfection. Nature does not make mistakes. You know, this is also a carved block, but a carved block with many possibilities, even that, it, that it's carved. It's still full of possibility. It could represent many shapes, it could contain many ideas. So this is the kind of thing that you find in gardens. Natural objects are the beautifying objects, not the man-made ones. The Chinese love of nature is, is very profound. And there's this tremendous contrast. The yin and yang is you have the ancient, this is Jade Garden in Shanghai, and then look at these skyscrapers and look at the cranes. You know, you used to see the birds, you know, the cranes. Now you see the other kind of crane. And, and it's just transformed out of recognition. China's just amazing. Is it it's seen, I mean, what's happening? You're a young person in China, you've seen already, even in your lifetime, amazing changes, right? And there will be more. Chinese are already the world's largest consumer of energy. They've surpassed us, and soon they'll surpass us economically. Um, and, and yet the old things are still there, and I hope that the Chinese uh, people will continue to value their treasures and not lose them in this great mad rush to technological and economic uh, supremacy. So this is, a, I don't know the name of the skyscraper, but it's got a hole in the top. You see that? It's got a big aperture. That's because they had the Feng Shui people come in and look at the blueprint. The blueprint didn't have that. Okay? You, you know this story because we, we talked about it in Chinese philosophy class. So the Feng Shui people said, there's a problem with this building. They said, there's no place for the dragons to fly through. <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, there wasn't. Well, now there is. Well, the dragons are happy. That means everybody else is happy. Okay? So the old and the new, they, they, they come together in a beautiful and surprising way. And I hope it stays that way. You took us to 798. This is an amazing place. You want to know where Bohemia is? It's in Beijing, okay? Where's the true Bohemian culture in the next incarnation? It's not in Bohemia, and it's not in Greenwich Village anymore. It used to be. Now it's in Beijing. This is a 798 art district where you see the old stuff, the traditions are there, but there's all this new stuff is happening. And the government says it's fine in this region and they're producing politically incorrect art, and they're making movies and sculptures and things. They're free to create a little bit, okay? It was a surprising thing. It's a few square blocks of a uh, formerly abandoned industrial neighborhood, which has been converted to this art city. 
this culture city. And there's lots of young people there just full of creativity, and they're allowed uh, and encouraged to be creative in this place. And I hope they're not getting into too much trouble yet. Okay, they might, right? But they're, they're given this opportunity to be free, and you see they're so happy because they can exercise uh, the freedom of the uncarved block, that is create something from within without worrying about any kind of conditions being imposed from the outside. That's the uncarved block. Um, and here's a monk in Shaolin Temple. Thank, uh, thank, thanks to Sin I got to visit and Julian and I got to meet the abbot, thanks to you. And uh, Mount Song, one of the five holy mountains of China is there. This monk, what's he doing? That's not Kung Fu. Oh yes, this is very advanced. Again, he's practicing being the uncarved block, more advanced than the movement. The uncarved block contains all possible movements. And what are the two stories? Here they are in one picture. Does anybody recognize the tall guy? Nobody recognizes? If I tell you who he is, you'll know. Okay? Tall guy? Lama Rinchen knows who this is. Are you a basketball fan too? I used to be. Well, the uncarved block. You're the uncarved block, <laughs> okay? E indeed, indeed, you're correct. That's, that's uh, Karim Abdul Jabbar, uh, formerly Lou Alcindor, right? Before he became an NBA superstar. And it's very difficult to take a picture with Karim Abdul Jabbar, okay? They have a special lens that makes him look shorter and everybody else taller. It's the only way you can fit in the frame. The guy is he's really tall. It's hard for us. It does, this, this picture makes us look taller, him look shorter. He's kind of stupid. It's the only way to take a picture with him. Um, how do we come to take a picture with him? Uh, the, the guy on the left who almost came today. Um, he, he, he's a friend whom I only meet outside of the U.S. He's an American entrepreneur named Parag Amin, who's Indian, but he's a, an American entrepreneur. Um, and uh, then there's Karim, and next to Karim is Michelle Smith, and that's what, who my story is about, but also Karim. Uh, we were in Abu Dhabi uh, at the Festival of Thinkers. This is Sheikh Nahayan's palace. So we met in the palace, and Karim, immediately when he discovered that, that I was a professor here at City College, he immediately warmed up to me, and uh, he, we, we started talking, because he grew up in this neighborhood. He's from here originally although he became famous at UCLA and in the NBA, he's from here, he's from the hood. And Karim told me, um, when he was, of course, Lou Alcindor, you know, growing up in New York, his dad studied at the Juilliard School of Music. Did you know that, Suzanne? Well, okay, I mean, I'm just, it's, it's, maybe ask your colleagues in the music department if anybody realizes that, that his dad was a trombonist, and he graduated from Juilliard, but in those days he couldn't play in a symphony. You understand? Um, I mean, w w in, in a certain way sad and cruel and, and all of the injustice because he was good enough to, <laughs> to get into Juilliard, not many or, and good enough to graduate with a performance degree from Juilliard, even fewer can do that. And he would have been, I'm sure, a great trombonist. Instead, he became a firefighter to support his family. And if you go to Juilliard and ask how many, uh, ask their students if, how many aspire to, to be firefighters when they graduate from Juilliard, not too many probably want to be firefighters. On the other hand, if you went and asked you know, how many firefighters you know, went to Juilliard, not too many. So he was an exceptional man, very exceptional, but he did not. He was the uncarved block because his response was, well, okay, th this is what it is. This is the reality. I, I have a gift, which I'm not allowed to express as fully as possible. Instead of being bitter about this, I will encourage my son to be even more gifted and to have such a great gift that no one will be able to prevent him. So, so the father said, well, then let the son do better. That's the American dream. I will not let this stop success from happening in our family. In fact, we'll make a bigger success out of this obstacle. Uh, that's a beautiful thing that he did. And you could only do that by being the uncarved block, refusing to be carved into the shape of, of injustice and, 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 and grievance and, 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 you know, and desire maybe for revenge and all of this. He took his ego out of the equation. He said, you know what? My son will, will do better than me, even if I were a trombonist, so what? There are a lot of them, you know, but, but there are not very many. You know, he became, right, a great superstar. And so th that, that is a gift from his father too. I think it's a very Taoist, I think it's a Taoist story. And Michelle Smith is totally 
the uncarved block. Here's what happened to her. In case you don't know who she is, uh, Michelle is a two-time gold medalist from the women's baseball team, women's softball, okay? Two-time gold medalist. But before she won her gold medals, and she was practicing with the team, she told me the story in Abu Dhabi. I was absolutely amazed by this. Incredible story. So I'll, I'll just tell you the story. Uh, she was driving to practice one day, and uh, baseball practice, and she had a car accident. You know, I mean, her, it happens, believe me. And she, you know, her car collided with another car, and she got flung uh, from the vehicle. And she said that it was, as she was sailing through the air, like sometimes time slows down in these cases. And so for her, she had time to formulate a thought. And as she was sailing through the air, she formulated the thought, I wonder what part of me is going to get injured when I hit whatever it is that's going to stop me, you know, as I'm flying through the air. I mean, she had time to formulate that thought, and then she was, it was answered. She hit a tree, and she was perfectly fine except for her pitching arm. The one part of her body that was the most important to her was mangled and broken and twisted. So, you know, she went to a hospital and got the arm set and went through, you know, a long and painful rehab. And you see she's hiding it in the picture because it's really quite deformed. It sticks out at the wrong angle. I mean, it looks like to the untutored eye a kind of, a, we would say, a deformity. Um, she's not conspicuously embarrassed. She just happens to be arm in arm with Karim. But that arm, that right arm of hers doesn't look the same as the left. And she said the doctors told her it's never going to be normal. It's never going to heal properly. Your elbow is, you know, damaged and your arm is deformed. And you know what? Her response was, okay, well, uh, I'm going to pitch anyway. See how I pitch with this. She was the uncarved block. She refused to be uh, carved into the shape of deformity. And you know what? She soon discovered that she could pitch faster with a deformed arm <laughs> and not lose accuracy. So she became a better pitcher. And that's when she won the two gold medals, by the way. It was after the accident that she, that she attained her, her supreme talent. As, a, as a, an Olympic gold medalist pitcher. So isn't that a beautiful story? Because what other people would look at and perceive as a deformity, for her was a huge advantage. So what's a deformity? Maybe it's really an advantage. And if you're the uncarved block inside and you refuse to have the preconception of what it is, maybe it makes you better than you are. I'm sure that that's what a Taoist would say. The uncarved block is all possibility, and we all have that capacity. So uh, thanks to you, and, and thanks to these little teachings from Lao Tzu, uh, opportunity to share just a few things. The book has many more of these teachings. And what astonishes me is that a, a uh, world-famous psychiatrist and a, a famous philosopher and a deep ecologist and a Tibetan Lama and, and a, 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 you know, a business leader and a Chinese-American tutor and a dance teacher from Beijing and a Japanese lay Buddhist president of the International Association all have one thing in common, among other things, and their humanity, of course, but they all have some respect and admiration for the Tao. They recognize there's some greatness in it. And if such an enormously diverse array of people can see some merit in the Tao, then I think everybody can see some merit in the Tao. And so that's my story. It's a privilege to share it with you. And thank you very much for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much.